that first batch of sauerkraut. I mean, first of all, I couldn't believe how simple the process was. You know, I couldn't believe how delicious the, you know, the lightly fermented sauerkraut was after just a couple of weeks. Um, and then, I, you know, I just started experimenting. That's world-renowned fermentation educator and best-selling food writer, Sander Katz. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock, and I am super psyched about today's show because I get to talk to one of my heroes. Yes, one of my heroes is the world-famous sauerkraut guy, Sander Katz. So what does fermentation have to do with industrial hemp? Great question. Uh, Not too much, but we do touch on it in our conversation. We talk about all kinds of things, the history of agriculture, the history of fermentation, some philosophy, and of course, making sauerkraut. So we're going to take a quick sponsor break, and then we'll get into my conversation with Sander Katz. This episode is brought to you in part by All Walks Small Animal Hemp Bedding. All Walks is a lifestyle pet brand created by IND Hemp to bring high quality, sustainable hemp pet products to the pet store. Launched in March of 2022 at the Global Pet Expo with a third place new product award, All Walks is now available on Amazon and is coming to a pet store near you soon. So ask your local pet stores to carry All Walks Hemp Bedding. You can learn more at allwalkspet.com. All walks, hemp goods for a better path. This episode is brought to you in part by New Holland Agriculture. New Holland is a proud Lancaster County company with a strong global presence. For over 125 years, They've been building, selling, and servicing machinery to help farmers feed a busy world. You can learn more about this world-class leader in farm equipment at newholland.com. Okay, welcome back to the show. So over the past 10 years or so, I've been really into making fermented foods, you know, sauerkrauts and pickles, and I even made five gallons of mead a few years ago. And I owe all of that interest to today's guest and to the magic of radio. I'll explain all of that during the interview, but just suffice it to say that, yeah, I'm really, really uh, thankful that I had the chance to talk to Mr. Sander Katz today. And if you heard last week's episode, you know that I was out in Montana for the IND Hemp Summer Summit. I made it home safely. Uh, I met so many great people out there and heard just fantastic conversations. You know, it is fascinating to me to see the industry put itself together. So um, look for upcoming interviews with some of the folks I met out there in Montana. Uh, And then this week, I had the chance to go out to the field day at King's Agri-Seeds in Lancaster County. You know, they had their hemp varieties on display. They had uh, varieties from New West Genetics, International Hemp, and Verve Seeds. I wrote a story about this at LancasterFarming.com and shot a video. So you can find those links on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. All right, so that catches you up. So let's get into my conversation with Sander Katz. Best-selling author, James Baird Award winner, the godfather of modern fermentation, Sander Katz, it is my absolute honor to welcome you to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm, uh, I'm so happy to be speaking with you today. Great. So a couple of weeks ago, I was making a series of pickling videos for LancasterFarming.com, and I wrote a companion piece to that, and I was watching one of your TED Talks, and I quoted you in that article, and then I thought, there's a guy that I, I would love to talk to. And so sort of went out on a limb and wrote to you, and here you are. So thank you for that. So there's not a lot of things in my life that I can point to and say, yeah, my life changed at that point. You know, I got a Beatles record for Christmas in 1983. I remember meeting my wife, the birth of my children. But I remember hearing you on Fresh Air with Terry Gross in the summer of 2012. And everything changed at that point for me. I remember, I think you described fermentation as that sweet spot between fresh and rotted. And like from that point, I was I was hooked. I'm like, what is this? 
And so you you single-handedly changed my relationship with food, with my own health and body, with my garden, with my senses, just everything. So uh, I, I didn't invite you here to just to gush at you and tell you how awesome you are, but I just wanted to, uh, you know, express my appreciation for you and uh, the work you're doing in this world. So thank you. Okay. Well, 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 that's very, very sweet. Uh, uh, thank you so much for, for those kind words. And, um, you know, fermentation is important. Everybody has a relationship with fermentation. It's just that, you know, most people aren't thinking about it. They're just, you know, enjoying the, 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 the products of fermentation, um, you know, without really, uh, thinking too much about the process of fermentation. Right. Well, let's talk about your journey into fermentation. Um, I think from what I understand, it was uh, your desire to sort of take better control of your health through food. So can you give us a, a look into that? Sure. I mean, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, um, you know, there were definitely a, a number of stages in the development of my interest in fermentation. And, you know, I would say, you know, first, as, as a kid, uh, I loved pickles. Uh, you know, I grew up in New York City. My grandparents were all immigrants from Eastern Europe. The kinds of pickles that we ate in my family were uh, uh, what we called sour pickles outside of New York. They're largely known as kosher dills. Um, but, um, you know, these are, you know, cucumbers fermented in a brine and I didn't know this as a kid. I just knew I, I just was crazy about that lactic acid flavor of, of fermentation. And I knew that there were other kinds of pickles and I've never been a pickle I didn't like, but that I particularly liked, you know, these kinds of pickles that my family was eating that I now can recognize as products of fermentation, a lactic acid fermentation. So anyway, for whatever reason, I was drawn as a kid without knowing anything about it to, to flavors of fermentation. You know, then in my mid twenties, I spent a couple of years following a macrobiotic diet and macrobiotics places uh, uh, quite a strong emphasis on the digestive benefit of pickles and other kinds of live fermented foods. And, you know, I just started observing that, you know, these pickles that I'd been eating my entire life, whenever I would eat them, I could feel the salivary glands under my tongue squirting out saliva. And I really began to uh, associate these pickles and related foods, uh, 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 sauerkraut, other kinds of live ferments like miso with, you know, quite literally getting my digestive juices flowing. And I started really seeking them out as, uh, you know, as, as, as a health practice. Um, but, you know, really the, the, the catalyst for my investigation of how to ferment things came a few years later when I left New York City and moved to rural Tennessee, where I've lived, you know, really for half of my life now. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, one of the changes that came with that is I started gardening. And, you know, I was such a naive city kid. I, I had never really thought about the cycles of the garden or the idea that, you know, all of the cabbages are ready at about the same time. All of the radishes are ready at about the same time. So, you know, the first season when I was gardening, when, you know, we had a beautiful row of cabbages uh, uh, and, you know, suddenly I had this question, what are we going to do with all these cabbages all at once? Well, I, you know, I had a, I mean, I knew I loved sauerkraut. I had a vague idea that sauerkraut had something to do with preserving cabbage. So, um, you know, I opened up the joy of cooking. I learned how to make sauerkraut from the joy of cooking. And, um, you know, that first batch of sauerkraut, I mean, first of all, I couldn't believe how simple the process was. Um, you know, I couldn't believe how delicious the, you know, the lightly fermented sauerkraut was after just a couple of weeks. Um, and then, I, you know, I just started experimenting. Oh, what happens if I put carrots in here or turnips or different kinds of seasonings? Um, you know, how important is the specific amount of salt that the Joy of Cooking told me to use? What if I use less salt or more salt? Like, um, you know, I just started experimenting and playing around with the process. And then I also learned how to make yogurt. And I did my first experiments with country wine. And, you know, uh, somebody pointed me to the book of miso. And I, I, I made my first batch of miso by the end of that first year. And, um, 
you know, I just really went down the rabbit hole of, of, of fermentation. And, you know, I mean, part of it was a desire for um, um, uh, good health. And I was dealing with some, some, some health issues and it was, was important to me to maintain health. But, you know, I also was falling in love with the flavor of these foods and with, you know, the practical benefits of, of, of preservation. So, you know, it was, it was a lot of different things that got me interested in it personally. And then, you know, it was really just a personal obsession that, you know, I shared with my friends. Uh, for the first five years, but then I got invited to teach some people who I know who uh, were turning their family's homestead into a little eco-education center, the Sequatchie Valley Institute here in Tennessee. They were host, uh, hosting an event in the summer of 1998 that they were calling Food for Life, and it was like a food skill sharing event. And they invited me to teach a sauerkraut making workshop, and it was, you know, the first time I'd ever done something like that. And the revelation to me from my first experience teaching was that you know, a lot of people projected all of the anxiety that they'd been taught to have about bacteria onto the idea of cultivating bacteria in a jar. So, you know, even foods that, are, I mean, food really does not get safer than sauerkraut. You know, fermented vegetables are safer than the vegetables are raw, statistically speaking. There are, you, you know, really like hardly any reports anywhere ever in the world of illness or food poisoning from fermented vegetables. Um, um, you know, it is totally a strategy for safety. And yet, you know, because we've all grown up, you know, hearing about how dangerous bacteria are, and with these sort of generalized fears about food preservation, and we don't even really know, you know, what to be afraid of. Uh, you know, I remember this young woman in my workshop holding up a jar of the vegetables we had just shredded and salted and uh, uh, stuffed into the jars. And she had this uh, a really worried look on her face. And she said, how can I be sure there are good bacteria growing in here and, you know, not some dangerous bacteria that might um, you know, make me sick or even kill somebody. Um, and, you know, frankly, that forced me to start doing some more reading and research. Like I had never, um, you know, worried about that myself. Um, right, right. Um, but, you know, once I started realizing that this was a, a common concern, you know, I wanted to be able to answer that question. So, you know, I really started doing some more, you know, research and, and, and reading. And then that event became an annual event that I was teaching at, you know, 1998, 99, 2000. The summer of 2001, I just, I had a conflict. I wasn't able to attend that event. And instead I spent a month writing all my fermentation recipes down. And, you know, the first iteration of what was to become my first book, Wild Fermentation was a zine, uh, you know, a 32 page self-published right. zine. Um, and, uh, but as soon as I wrote that, you know, I realized like, oh, okay, this is something that, you know, I have a lot to say about, I have a lot to learn about, uh, uh, you know, and frankly, there's a lot of um, uh, misinformation. There's a lot of, um, um, you know, everyone has a connection to fermentation, whether it's through, you know, uh, something their grandparents were doing or stories their grandparents were telling, or, you know, in the case of, of immigrants from anywhere, you know, food memories from the old country, um, um, you know, or in the case of anyone who's involved in agriculture, the, you know, sort of necessity for, um, um, uh, you know, easy, low energy strategies for preserving the harvest or, you know, people become, I mean, really a lot of the interest in fermentation grew, uh, I, I think, you know, after the micro, the, the human microbiome project with, you know, the recognition that, you know, we need bacteria. We have these elaborate communities of bacteria that, give us a lot of our functionality and, and help us maintain our health and well-being, um, you know, and yet there are all these factors in our modern lives that diminish the biodiversity of those communities. So, you know, a lot of people really started seeking out bacterial foods for um, health reasons. So, um, um, you know, I, I just I decided to, to write a book about how to how to ferment things. Right. Were you a writer before that or did this um, draw you into writing? 
Well, sure. I mean, I mean, as a young person, certainly in college, after college, I, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to be a writer, but, you know, like most people who have the idea of being writers, I had no idea, you know, what to write about. Um, uh, but, you know, my, my, my early jobs, um, uh, uh, most of them all had to do with writing. You know, I, I worked in municipal government, but I was, you know, in these offices where, you know, most of what I actually did day to day was, was, was writing. Um, so, um, so sure, yes. I mean, I was a writer, but you know, this suddenly gave me uh, like a like a focus of something sure. you know really interesting that I thought that there was a lot of interest in to write about. Right. Um, so the story of fermentation is intrinsically tied to the story of agriculture. Can you talk about that relationship? Maybe you know throughout human history. Well, sure. I mean, I would just say that the that the story of fermentation goes much further back than, than, than agriculture. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, so, so, I mean, I would generally describe fermentation in a very, um, uh, you know, uh, general way as fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, if you were to ask a biologist, what is fermentation? They'll give you a very, very different answer, which is that they'll tell you that fermentation is anaerobic metabolism the production of energy without oxygen. And in this sense, you know, the earliest life forms that we believe emerged on the earth were all fermenting organisms. You know, the, 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 you know when the earliest bacteria uh, and archaea emerged, there was, you know, there wasn't oxygen uh, uh, in the environment. And, um, you know, they were anaerobic organisms. They were fermenting organisms. So, you know, you could argue that, um, um, you know, the earliest forms of life were fermenting organisms and it was really fermenting organisms that, you know, sort of gave rise to, you know, multicellular forms of life, including plants and fungi and uh, animals and human beings. Um, so, you know, our evolutionary story, you know, goes way back with fermentation. Now, in terms of like the human practice of fermentation, I mean, I, I should say nobody really knows because, um, you know, fermentation is so ancient that it predates recorded history. And, you know, many of the oldest surviving documents in different writing traditions you know, make reference to fermentation traditions that were already well established in those parts of the world. For instance, like the, the Sumerian tablets, you know, talk about bread and they talk about beer. Um, um, so, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of speculation about the origins of fermentation. The earliest evidence we have of um, human fermentation is pottery shards from China that are 10,000 years old, uh, and they have residue of alcohol on them. So that's, uh, you know, that's a byproduct of fermentation or of certain fermentations. And, um, you know, alcohol is by far the most widespread um, uh, uh, form of fermentation. But, you know, I, I would say that, that, you know, those pottery shards tell us more about the history of pottery than they tell us about the history <laughs> of fermentation. And that presumably the earliest fermentation vessels were either, you know, hollowed out wood or um, uh, animal membranes of various kinds or gourds or, you know, the, the things we know of that people in the past used to hold water, um, um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, fermented beverages all involve water. Um, uh, so, so I think that fermentation is very ancient, but uh, I mean, certainly in the emergence of agriculture, there's, um, you know, there's, there's been a debate going among um, archaeologists over the last uh, um, 50 or 100 years, um, which came first, bread or beer. I mean, it's clear that, you know, in the emergence of grain agriculture in particular, you know, fermentation has been, um, uh, uh, you know, very, very critical. And, you know, I would say conceptually, you know, fermentation is an essential part of how people make effective use of food resources wherever they are. And, you know, you could imagine being a hunter gatherer and spending each day procuring the food resources to get you through that day. But once you start thinking about taking food resources that are available today in some kind of abundance and wanting to 
save them in some way to eat tomorrow or next week or next month or months from now. You know, you're always going to be dealing with the dynamics of microorganisms on the food. Even if you don't specifically know about the microorganisms of the food, you can observe that over time food changes. And, you know, in every part of the world, people observed, you know, under what conditions would the food, you know, be better preserved or, or, or transform in a way that, um, uh, um, you know, was in some way improving the food rather than just decomposing the food. Right. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I mean, fermentation techniques developed in different ways in different parts of the world. And culture sort of developed from there, like in society. But is it a coincidence that we use the word culture to describe society and also how we describe what's happening with the, uh, the biology in fermentation? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 very interesting that 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 you know we 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 call the little you know packet of bacteria that you would add to milk in order to make yogurt. We we call those cultures, and um, uh, you know, um, um, well, I mean, I, I, let, let me just cite for for a second the work of this really important uh, cultural theorist of the 20th century, Claude Levi Strauss. But he really viewed the the original act of culture as making mead, mead being uh, you know fermented honey water. Um, and you know he he illustrates this by describing a band of early hominids who have the good fortune of coming across this uh, uh, murky puddle in the ground that's a beehive that washed out of a tree in a storm. It spontaneously began to ferment. It was bubbling. It smelled good. They were brave enough to, to, to sip it. It tasted good. They, they drank that murky water in the puddle. They, they had a light feeling. Um, you know, they experienced inebriation. But it was a natural phenomenon that they were lucky enough to, to stumble upon. And they didn't necessarily have any specific insight into how they could make that happen on their own terms. But at some point, people figured out how to use a hollowed out trunk of a tree as a vessel, how to climb up in a tree and take down a hive, how to dilute it with water and make mead. And for Claude Levi-Strauss, this is the original act of culture is, is um, uh, um, um, making, uh, um, uh, you know, developing techniques, making these things happen on their own, on our own terms, and then passing down the information of how to do that. And, you know, really the word culture, you know, so, sort of comes from the, a, a root, which is which means like sort of wheels and going around, and 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 we conceptualize it as anything, you know, we pass down from generation to generation. So you know, seeds are biological, but they're also cultural because we develop them, and you know, the well-being of our of our descendants depends on our passing down the seeds as well as the information about how to make use of them. And, um, you know, fermentation is really part of that same set of, um, um, you know, information that people using our skills at language are able to pass down from generation to generation. And, um, um, you know, we have just come to, um, um, you know, use the word culture quite broadly. And, um, um, you know, we, we, we've come to call the, um, um, you know, the, the, the organisms themselves, the, the, the starters, the, those are cultures as well. But, but you can't separate them, the biology, from the information on how to make use of them, which is the, you know, distinctively cultural aspect. Um, in your most recent book, Fermentation Journeys, you traveled all over the world, exploring different cultures and their cultures of fermentation. Did you find any, any cultures without a tradition of fermented foods or beverages? Well, I mean, um, I mean, I certainly do not possess encyclopedic knowledge, um, but I know I have never been to any part of the world where, um, uh, you know, there has not been fermentation going on. Um, you know, through the years, people have proposed to me ideas of parts of the world where they have the idea that no fermentation was, was occurring historically. Um, and every time I've been able to find examples of, 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 of fermentation. And, you know, I, I mean, fermentation might be universal, but of course, cultural continuity isn't. And, you know, I mean, I mean certainly around North America, there, there are a 
lots of, you know, uh, uh, indigenous cultures that, um, you know, and people were forced to move, people were forced to assimilate, um, um, it, you know, people were running for their lives. And, and, and of course, I mean, many, many traditions have been lost. And I've certainly met people from, you know, let's say specific uh, uh, North American tribes who have not been able to find any specific examples of fermentation that their ancestors uh, uh, were doing. But certainly, I mean, in, in regions all around North America, I have found evidence of, of fermentation. And um, um, so, so certainly it's been part of the context in North America. For years, people were telling me that the Aboriginal people of Australia had not developed any fermentation traditions. And the first time I visited uh, uh, Australia, I went on uh, a wild foods walk with an Aboriginal elder in uh, Queensland. And the very first you know, tree we stopped to talk about, there were nuts scattered on the ground and people started picking up the nuts and he said, don't eat them. They're quite poisonous until you soak them in water for a few days. Well, guess what happens when you soak a dried food in water is it awakens dormant microorganisms and you know, those organisms start accessing nutrients and, um, um, you know, it's, it's actually a quite widespread application of fermentation to break down toxic compounds and plants into benign forms. So, you know, right there was, uh, was fermentation. And since I've learned of a, of, of a number of other traditional indigenous uh, uh, Australian fermentation processes. I mean, my thinking about this is that, you know, what microbiology has enabled us to recognize that, you know, all of the plants and all of the animal products that make up our food are populated by microorganisms. So there's a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food. And not every microbial transformation of food is pretty. I mean, you know, when food decomposes or rots, that's microbial transformation. But, um, uh, you know, really as a practical matter in every part of the world, people had to sort of develop techniques to prevent that from happening. And encourage, um, uh, you know, what we, what, you know, historically people didn't necessarily recognize as microbial processes, but which we now can recognize as microbial processes that elevated the food in some way, whether it's um, creating alcohol, whether it's breaking down some toxic compound, whether it's making nutrients more, more easily available, whether it's making things taste better, uh, whether it's preserving food. So, you know, there's this whole range of practical benefits benefits to fermentation, but there's always a practical benefit to fermentation. Okay. Um, so bringing it back to industrial hemp a little bit. So I think there are some parallels between the art of fermentation and the hemp plant, at least, I don't know, bear with me here. So I feel like in the 20th century, in America anyway, um, maybe the art of fermentation was lost a little bit because of capitalism or processed food or whatever and people were sort of removed from from their food a little bit and with hemp you know it was made illegal in the 1930s and you know what we're seeing now is sort of a reconnection with these sort of i don't know um old wisdom lines and i credit you for bringing sort of repairing those wisdom lines bringing fermentation you know back into into uh, popular culture let, let me let me just say one thing about this, which yeah. is sure. I mean, I mean, people really largely stop thinking about fermentation. I would say, you know, up, up, up until a certain point, it, not that everybody was fermenting in every household, but, you know, it was happening in every community and people were witnessing fermentation. Um, um, I mean, I would say, you know, the products of fermentation have always uh, uh, had enduring appeal. Like if we think about bread, if we think about cheese, if we think about cured meats, if we think about vinegar, if we think about beer, if we think about wine, I mean, our grandparents, our great grandparents, wherever they were living, you know, they, they all were enjoying products of fermentation. So whether, you know, you can enjoy products of fermentation without thinking about fermentation at all. It can be happening in faraway factories where, where you don't have to think about it, but, you know, fermentation itself has enjoyed enduring uh, popularity. Let me talk about one um, uh, interesting application of fermentation in uh, uh, fiber arts. Uh, and there is a Dutch word, retting, 
which came into the English language. And yeah. redding is, is what has been used in a lot of fiber plants. I mean, it's really, it's Dutch for rotting. Um, and so, you know, if you have hemp stalks and you want to sort of use those fibers, whether it's to make uh, clothing or to make rope or for any other kind of application, you know, what you need to do is get rid of all the connective tissue between those fibers. The so you, you soak it in water. And that's like the traditional way that, you know, hemp fibers and many other, you know, fiber plants have, have been processed. So, I mean, fermentation is, you know, far larger than the world of, of, of food. It's just, you know, it's not only how people have made effective use of food resources, it's how people have made effective use of plant resources and, and, and animal resources. And um, 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 so, so, I mean, certainly in the fiber arts, so, you know, whether it's Reading to 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 liberate fibers and plants, whether it's you know dyeing techniques, you know there's just a huge amount of of, of fermentation, um, um, you know knowledge that that has you know been in traditional use, and 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 I know that in the history of hemp, it's 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 an integral part of it. Absolutely, yeah. We talk about reading a lot on this show, so thank you for making that connection. And my next question actually is, you know, is this solely about food for you, or other? Are there other applications for that process that capture your interest? And clearly, there are. Um, do you get in, like involved in bio digesters and things like that on farm? And it seems like there's a lot of uh, like green energy applications for fermentation. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, every every time I, you know, pump gas, you know, I'm there I am, you know, with my like 10% ethanol gas going into my car. So, you know, ethanol is, is all fermented. I mean, you know, mostly that's happening at a huge industrial scale. And, you know, I mean, I'm sort of vaguely interested in it because it's fermentation. Um, you know, I've learned a little bit about, about methane digesters. At one point, I, I built a, um, a biodiesel processing, uh, um, you know, sort of small scale at home uh, uh, setup. Um, so sure, I mean, I'm, I'm, I am, you know, quite interested in, um, um, you know, many different aspects of fermentation. I mean, you know, in agriculture, you know, a, a, a lot of ideas about, um, well, I mean, we could say that compost is, is fermentation. I've met people particularly around Latin America who have these, you know, uh, uh, more specifically liquid fermentation ideas for creating uh, biofertilizers in, um, um, you know, in, if you want to save tomato seeds uh, uh, or pepper seeds, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be much more, um, uh, uh, you'll get much greater germination if you ferment the seeds before you dry them. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's really like, you know, nearly infinite applications of, of fermentation. And, you know, and some of them are, you know, food and not food. Like, you know, if any of your listeners have, uh, you know, made kombucha and you have the mother of kombucha and you end up with more and more layers of kombucha mothers. Well, I mean, there's all of these like stories from like World War One. And, and by the way, kombucha was popular in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. And, and so when the Russian army was like, you know, running out of leather for boots, they were using kombucha mothers to, to make boots. And, you know, there's a contemporary fiber artist in London who's making big sheets of kombucha mothers and you know turning them into into garments so you know things aren't always food or not food you know there's a lot of things that you know could could be either All right uh, i just want to give a shout out to our friend olga she's here in chester county pennsylvania and uh, she uses i guess her grandmother's kombucha recipe olga's from siberia and the, the brand is baba's brew and it is it is the best kombucha i've ever had so just Shout out to Olga with Baba's Brew in, in Pennsylvania. If you ever get up here, seek it out. It's very good. There's one called Purple Rain that is so good. But anyway, I digress. So I'm interested in hemp for like the, the carbon sequestration and sort of like the paradigm shifting potential of this plant. I know there's a lot of talk of CBD and, you know, medicinal marijuana. But for me, it's about the industrial applications. It's the grain and the fiber. You know, the grain is a superfood, high in protein, uh, great omega profiles, etc. Have you done any work in, in hemp as a food? And are there any hemp, fermented hemp recipes out there that you've come across? 
Well, sure. I mean, I, 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 I certainly have um, uh, encountered people who are working particularly with the high protein seeds of hemp. Um, um, and, um, you know, incorporating them into, you know, miso or other things that, you know, traditionally are made with other kinds of beans or, or, or seeds. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of experimentation right now um, going on with, uh, so, so koji is a Japanese name for a particular fungus, Aspergillus oryzae or Aspergillus soye. Um, and generally people don't eat koji as a food, but, but when you grow the, this fungus, uh, uh, um, you know, whether it's on rice or soybeans or, or um, uh, hemp seeds or, or, or anything, it creates like this, uh, you know, incredible array of enzymes. Um, um, and it has um, amylase enzymes that can break down complex carbohydrates into simple sugars. And um, uh, that's important, let's say, for making sake and other kinds of alcoholic beverages based on rice or, or other grains. Um, uh, it, they produce protease enzymes that can break down proteins. And, and it's, you know, the, the reason why soy sauce has so much more flavor than a soybean is because you know, um, um, you know, the amino acids that are the building blocks of proteins end up having, you know, much more, much, much stronger, more compelling flavors than the, that, than, than the, the, than the protein itself. So, um, you know, in making miso and soy sauce and, and, and other similar foods, you know, it's, it's these protease enzymes and there's even lipase enzymes in koji that can break down, uh, uh, fats. So, um, you know, just an incredible range of foods. I mean, I guess I've mentioned a lot of them uh, um, um, just now are made from this, but, but, you know, as more and more chefs around the world are learning about koji and experimenting with koji, they're applying koji to just, um, you know, lots of different substrates. I mean, you know, I've run into people growing koji on pork chops or uh, pistachios, but, you know, among the range of things I've seen people growing koji on is is uh, 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 hemp seeds um, okay. and and sort of you know using the you know the the the, the high protein um, um, of that you, you sure, know and, seeds, yeah. and, and breaking it down into extraordinary flavor and using it in misos or um, uh, what some people sometimes say amino pastes or amino sauces which are like you know we can think of them as analogous to you know soy sauce and uh, uh, miso except you know using other kinds of substrates such as such as hemp. So, I mean, that's the main application that I've seen. I mean, certainly okay. I've seen people make, um, 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 you know, uh, marijuana infused kombuchas and uh, vinegars and, 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 and things like that. So, I mean, I think that there's a range of uh, uh, possibilities. And I think in, you know, in some of the states where, where it's legal, um, you know, people are, you know, developing all kinds of, you know, novel um, uh, food products. Right. Um, getting back to the koji, what does that look like? You know, when it develops, like, what does it look like? And then how do you use it in the in the next steps? Well, um, um, you know, so so it looks like what it started out being, whether that's a grain of rice or a soybean or a, or, or, or a, um, a hemp seed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, usually you would soak it and then steam it and then cool it down to uh, body temperature. And then you sprinkle a little starter on, which is spores of, of this fungus. Okay. Um, and then you keep it warm. You keep it, uh, um, you know, between, let's say, uh, 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, for about 48 hours and, um, basically like a, like a, a, a white fungus will develop on the surfaces like it, of it. So it you just get a little, it. you just get a little sort of fuzzy, uh, 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 surface on it. And, and, and then the fungus will sort of clump them together. And, you know, often during the process, people will break up the clumps just so the heat doesn't accumulate at the center 
at the center of it. Um, um, and then, you know, if you let it go too long, then the fungus will um, sporulate and it'll turn this sort of bright uh, kind of yellow green color. Um, uh, and for certain applications, people, people want that, but for most applications, people like to use it just when it has a, a sort of a, a bloom of this sort of, you know, white fuzzy fungus. Um, and then, you know, you can dry it out a little bit and, and, and store it for a while, or you, you know, it's best if you just are ready to use it fresh. I wonder if you could sort of give listeners a very basic sauerkraut recipe. Can you walk us through how to make a, a simple kraut? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And I'm glad that you're asking because, you know, really I can I can give a 30 second answer to that. You know, uh, uh, shred vegetables, create surface area, salt them to taste, add other seasonings if you like. Then spend a few minutes either squeezing or pounding. And what this does is um, uh, uh, breaks down cell walls, helps release juices. The objective is to get the vegetables submerged under their own juices. Um, um, and then you pack them into your vessel. Now, let me explain it in a little bit more detail. Um, but I mean, you know, the process could not be simpler. And so, you know, every fermentation uh, involves, you know, trying to manipulate environmental conditions to encourage the growth of the organisms that we want and simultaneously discourage the growth of organisms that, that we don't want. So, you know, on every head of cabbage, there is not only the lactic acid bacteria that we want, which, by the way, are not only on cabbage, they're on hemp, they're on radishes, they're on every plant growing out of soil on planet Earth, so far as botanists and microbiologists can tell. So my, my, uh, lactic acid bacteria are always there. There's no need to add a little packet of powder, although there are people who will try to sell you packets of powder for starting sauerkraut, but you don't need that. It's all there on whatever kinds of vegetables you, you wanna use. You don't have to limit yourself to cabbage. You could use carrots, turnips, mix different vegetables together, firm vegetables, uh, 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 you know, tend to work the best. So create surface area. You could chop them coarsely. You can shred it very finely, whatever you like. Salt. The salt is act actually not 100% essential. You can, there are traditions of fermenting without salt. Generally, you won't maintain a good texture because what gives vegetables crispness are pectins and salt hardens pectins and salt slows down enzymes that over time can break down pectins. So salt it to taste. Like, you know, if you grew up in a family where your grandparents were making kraut and learned from their, their grandparents, they probably were using a lot of salt because you go back a few generations and the sauerkraut what meant survival through the winter vitamin c through through the long season where there's no fresh uh, uh, vegetables but if your context is different most most likely in the in the 21st century and you can you you can make a much lower salt sauerkraut salt to taste you know add, add salt a little bit at a time let let the flavor of it be your guide, but it's always easier to add salt than it is to take salt away. So, so, so salt it to taste, add other seasonings. I love caraway seeds. Some people love juniper berries. You can add garlic, dill. You can be experimental. You can add like curry spices. I once had vanilla sauerkraut served to me. Um, you, you know, you, you don't be afraid to experiment with the, with the seasonings. And then you can either just let the salted vegetables sit for a few hours hours and the salt will draw plenty of juice out of them as long as they're fresh vegetables or you can speed that up either pounding or on a small scale I just like to squeeze with my hands um, and this just helps release juices from the vegetables once the veggies are nice and juicy you just pack them into a vessel whether that's a ceramic crock or a, jet, a glass jar a plastic bucket a wooden barrel stay away from metal because metal can be corroded by uh, salts and by acids. And here we're using salt to cultivate bacteria that produce acids. Um, a jar is probably the easiest for most people. A quart size jar will take about two pounds of vegetables to fill it up. Um, and then you just wanna, wanna pack the vegetables with some force into the vessel so that you, 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 you displace all of the air pockets and the vegetables end up being submerged. 
Then, you know, a little bit of weight on top helps. What I sometimes do as an improvisational thing is save an outer leaf of cabbage with a heavy spine and use that heavy spine as almost like a spring to hold the vegetables down other, uh, uh, under, under the, the brine. And then you wait. And, you know, the million dollar question is how long do you wait? You know, how, how long does it need to ferment for? And there's no objective answer to that question. To a certain degree, it'll depend on the temperature and the environment where you ferment it. If you want to ferment it all winter long, then a cellar is perfect where it stays roughly the earth's temperature. If you want to do it in your kitchen, which is what I would recommend for most people, um, um, you know, trying this out for the first time, you know, give it four or five days and then taste it and then pack it down, wait a few more days, taste it again. The acids accumulate over time. Um, it'll get more and more acidic, not infinitely, it'll reach some plateau. But you know, the thing is people like it at different levels of acidity and that's why ultimately it's a subjective uh, uh, question. And so maybe you'll get to the bottom before you ever think that it's too sour or maybe one day you'll taste it and you'll think like, I don't want this to get any more sour. This is plenty sour for me, for my kids, for my partner, whoever. And then, well, guess what? Chances are, if you're living in the United States in 2022, you have a fermentation slowing device in your kitchen. That's the refrigerator. Just put it into the refrigerator and then it'll last indefinitely. But hopefully it won't last indefinitely because it'll be so delicious that you'll just want to eat it. And a lot of times people's block is they don't know what to do with sauerkraut. So, you know, this morning I, I had eggs. I had like a, veg, a vegetable scramble. I have a little bit of sauerkraut with it. Anytime I make a sandwich, I put a little bit of sauerkraut on it. Um, sauerkraut's a great, um, uh, uh, um, you know, side dish with almost anything that, that you could prepare. If you have extra juice at the end, don't pour that down the drain. You know, either drink it or use it in like salad dressings and other kinds of sauces. Um, so, um, you know, sauerkraut is wonderful. I mean, you know, I think that one of the nutritional powers of sauerkraut is the probiotic. So you want to eat some of it raw, but that doesn't mean you could never cook it. And, you know, all of the traditions that make use of, you know, sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, other, other styles of fermented vegetables also cook with them. So like in Polish cuisine, there's this great thing called bigos. Uh, which sometimes is translated as like hunter stew. Um, but, but basically you marinate meat in the sauerkraut and then you stew it slowly for a long time in the sauerkraut and it's incredibly delicious. In Korean culture, people make this um, uh, a kimchi soup. Uh, which is incredibly delicious. So don't be afraid to cook with some of it, but just make sure you eat a little bit of it uh, uh, raw so you get the uh, benefit of those probiotics. All right. Thank you for walking us through that. Um, so I, I found a, a jar of fermented cauliflower in our refrigerator. I'm pretty sure it's two years old. Still safe? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't worry at all about safety. I mean, it could be soft and mushy. It could have a texture that you will not find appealing. Um, if the jar was, you know, half empty, you could have to, just like you would find in a half empty jar of jelly, you could have a little bit of mold on the surface. Yeah. If there's a little mold on the surface, I would just remove it and discard that. Um, you know, have a little taste, see what you think of the flavor and texture after all of this time. But, um, um, uh, you know, a, a salty, acidic food at refrigerator temperatures is is not going to present a, like any kind of a danger. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I loved when I was reading uh, your wild fermentation book, you, you talked about the mold on top, but you called it bloom, right? And that's just like a lovely way to to think about that. Well, you know, you're, you're uh, as I described earlier, you're getting the vegetables submerged really to protect them from oxygen because a different group of organisms will thrive in an oxygen rich environment. So the lactic acid bacteria dominate in the submerged vegetables, but the surface is always the most vulnerable place. And I mean, there are more and more kind of um, cleverly engineered ideas for how to protect the surface from oxygen. But, you know, this is all very new and traditionally what people everywhere have done with whatever kind of, um, uh, you know, funky layer might develop on the top is just skim it off and toss it out and, um, and you know, don't worry about it. Sander Katz, it is so great to talk to you. Thank you for your time today. It's an absolute honor.
Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. All right. And just like that, the show comes to an end. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Sander Katz. You can learn more about the work he's doing and the books he's written at his website, wildfermentation.com. I'll put a link to that on the show page for this episode at lancasterfarming.com. Uh, next week, we'll be back on the hemp train, so to speak, uh, bringing you more conversations from the world of industrial hemp. So uh, I hope you didn't mind this diversion too much. My name is Eric Herlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Check us out online at lancasterfarming.com. Get a subscription to our print edition. You will not be disappointed. If you like what you hear on the show and you want to get involved with supporting our show, we are always looking for sponsors and underwriters, so get in touch. Send an email to podcast at lancasterfarming.com. All right, until next week, I will see you in the newspaper. Industrial Hemp. Season 2, Episode 32 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2022 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. The show was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Aaron Kulak. The original music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tim, Bird, Shadow, 